Welcome everyone to the Metzba Accelerator Podcast brought to you by Everwell Marketing, the go-to resource so you can get the latest hacks and best practices to market and grow a profitable medical aesthetics practice. My name is Maripili and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing, operations, numbers, and helping you grow and take your Metzba to the next level. This is the Metzba Accelerator Podcast, Season 2. Hey, I'm so excited to have you guys here. This is Emily and Miranda from Cool Room. Hello. Hey there. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to ask you guys a little bit more about your background and a little tell us a little bit about your story. I don't know who would want to start. Um, I mean, we've both done everything from the beginning together with as far as starting up Cool Room. Um, I started out as a nurse and love taking care of patients and working with people in that capacity. Uh, but I was kind of trying to juggle the whole like home life and um, work balance kind of, it's not that I wanted to work less. I love working, but just if I could do it more around our kids' schedule. So I was like, well, what can I do? And so I started, you know, the business because kind of because of that. And Emily was the first person that came to my mind when I thought about who would I who would I want to run the practice and be the main person and lead everything. And um, I actually knew her uh, for a few years before that pretty well. So, um, and so she, I, you know, we kind of, I put it out there and she was like, all right, yeah, let's do it. Let's take a leap of faith. Let's go. <laughs> so, um, and she, uh, Emily, your job beforehand, uh, tell them a little bit about your job when I asked you about kind of switching. Yeah. So I, um, my background's in nutrition and dietetics. So I was working, um, with the state of Florida doing some nutritional counseling for women, infants, and children. Um, and I loved that job, but it was just, I think over the years, I realized like working for a big, well, I I say big company, but it's a government. So it's not like a company, but just in that setting, wasn't maybe my favorite thing. Um, and then when Miranda reached out, like kind of pitching me this idea, I was like, Hmm, actually that sounds amazing. (laughs) Um, so it was kind of cool. It wasn't something aesthetics. I think, and Miranda can agree to this aesthetics. Wasn't really something we ever saw ourselves going into. Um, but we really liked the approach of like, okay, this is an industry that has a long history of being a certain way, which is like, we're going to tell you how you need to look and you need to look like this model, you know, whatever the standard of beauty is, or whoever decides that I'm not sure who decided that in the beginning, but we really liked the approach of like, you know, we want to help people feel confident, um, and feel good about themselves, but that doesn't mean everybody looking like Barbie, right? Like not everybody needs to look the same way and we don't want to tell them how they look, but, um, we really liked that approach of the, you know, aesthetics world, um, or trying to break into it with that and kind of give Mm -hmm. some of the change it in a way, um, to be more like that, especially of the recent years, we love like all the self-love campaigns and like body positivity stuff that is going around. But so we liked that as, um, aspect of like trying to get into the aesthetic world, I think the most. And when she approached me, I, I loved working with her in the past and like, just in a personal relationship, we had a, a good one. And so I was really excited to get on board. Um, and, uh, also I loved how she was trying to kind of mix, like giving a good work-life balance, right. Of like, we want to work really hard, but we also have families. I, at the time I didn't have kids now I do. And I appreciate it even more. (laughs) Um, but I, you know, of course always it's a work-life balance is good for anybody, but Mm -hmm. so I, yeah, I was really excited about the opportunity to start this kind of, for me too, it was a big part of what I didn't love maybe about my other job was like the work culture. Everybody was kind of like just overworked and underappreciated. And like, you know, I tried to work hard, but it never seemed like it was, you know, sorry if my, I think somebody just, te- could you hear that when they text? I just got a text. Yeah. Yeah. My ears are working. <laughs> yes. I don't know how to turn that off. So I'm hoping nobody else texts me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would say a big a big thing to me was wanting to work somewhere where I could um, have a positive impact in the culture of the workplace. Um, because where I currently was wasn't the best culture. And so I was really excited to help create that. And I knew Miranda pers- as a person and how she would put a positive um, culture into wherever she was starting. So it's been great ever since. Definitely liking where you work. I think it's just so key to keep also that like life work balance. You're like Mm -hmm. doing it's 
easier to kind of exactly like that in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just talked about that today earlier. We we're like, it really does start from the root. Like when you talk about patient care and how everything translates over to them and how they receive us. You know, Emily was giving an example about um, a patient that came in and just said, everybody is just always so like happy and loves their job. And I'm like, we, but we really do. Like, and I think if you can start with the staff, like being happy at their job and loving what they do, it really just kind of is contagious and it, you know, trickles over to the patients as they come in right. um, when you're happy at your job and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. I, I didn't know. So you guys, I knew that you guys knew each other from before then. And now it almost seems like you're almost like sisters, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's been, I, I'd say since 2013 or 14, it's been a, yeah. it's been a good amount. Yep. People yeah. often be like, wait, are, are you guys related? I wasn't sure just because of how we interact. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, blood, like biologically no, but all <laughs> intents and purposes. Yes. <laughs> Although everybody says my daughter looks exactly like Emily and not, not me. <laughs> there might be some blood relation in there. We're not sure how it got like, there. nope, nope. <laughs> but, um, it's kind of true. I hadn't really noticed that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't notice it either until a couple people randomly said, is that her aunt kind of thing? Cause they look so much. Like, I'm like, I never even thought to think that. Yeah. Yeah. Emily's like, yes, at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I'll claim it. (laughs) So take me back a little bit to when like Cool Room officially started. Like how did that came about where you're like, okay, well, what are the first few steps that we need to take in order for this to actually work? Um, I mean, before I even took the initiative to just say, okay, this is what the decision is. I obviously did a lot of exploring to make sure that it was a business model that would be worth taking that risk because there's always risk starting a business. And obviously a lot of people will fail several times at it. That's common before you have that one success. So I wanted to just really, even though that's a chance, I wanted to be like, okay, is this worth that chance and that risk? Um, I did work with, um, I reached out and worked with somebody in another state that I knew had been successful um, with a business model that I sort of aligned with in the sense of kind of like specializing in one thing. Um, I kind of liked that approach versus like ha- offering a bunch of things that you can be do a little bit of, but then you're really good at one thing. You're going to be the expert at it. It's all you do every day, all day, and just put your focus into that. Um, and so I met and did that. And she um, actually had a lot of great advice um, to get me started as far as just where to explore. Um, and it really has just been a great model as far as all around. Um, I won't, I won't get into too many details or we'll be here for two hours, but <laughs> as I talk too much, but um, it really is able to allow us to have that balance that we've talked about. Just, you know, we work harder than we did before at our other jobs, but it's just doesn't feel like it because it's on our own terms and time and um, much more flexible. When we started also, um, our contact had introduced us to a couple of people, one of them being um, Everable, which is how we met you. Yeah. And, um, you know, so she kind of um, started that and, and emphasized the importance of maybe considering getting on board with that before we open, which is not typical. Wow. Um, and so once we did that, I felt like that was the game changer for us, even though it took a little more upfront before we had started running as a business. Um, Cause it is it's like, we're, we're already starting at your, you know, you got this, we had all these delays and extra costs and things that you don't um, always plan for. And then you're like, okay, now I got to put more money in before we even have opened our doors and, you know, really kind of looked at that and just thought, okay, let's, let's set us up for success, you know, even though it's going to cost us a little more. And I think that that was huge for us, honestly, because then when we did open, we hit the ground running. Um, So that was, that was kind of, those were our resources, I would say that helped kind of support our infancy uh, year, a couple of years, three years ago. Three years ago. Yeah. Yes. I went from working in Miranda's kitchen table (laughs) um, to Mm -hmm. like and running the business so Mm -hmm. for sure but a fun Mm -hmm. one it has been because I even remember when we started um talking you guys still were under construction right yeah yeah 
And then we had like a few delays with it. Like, like even though we thought it was just going to be a certain amount. So yeah, that, that kind of set us back. So we thought, okay, how can we keep, you know, getting ourselves ready, preparing for us to be successful without, cause we didn't want to be on hold, even though our place was. So we tried to just continue to travel and educate ourselves. Um, we worked with um, Everable to um, help us really get our website and our content evolved and kind of established ahead of time, which helped as well. So we put our focus into things like that, which um, helped us really be ready and just uh, on point when we did open so that we could keep that momentum going. And even though we had that delay, um, we still were able to use the time, you know, yeah. efficiently. Yeah. yeah, I think establishing the brand before we opened was really a positive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of course, I'm biased, right? As a designer, <laughs> <and marketing. laughs> yeah. at, you know, being uh, ever, CEO at Everwolf, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. It definitely like even when we started, like I feel like we did focus so much on our brand. And once those everything like mm. the business model was set and what we wanted to do and how we wanted to work, the next big thing was really the brand. Like, because I feel like people don't understand, and I know like I talk about this a lot in um in our podcast and in like our social media, that you know, a brand is not just pretty colors and a logo and like a mm-hmm. cool website. But it's right. how you people feel and how you make people like at the end of the day remember you. Mm-hmm. So I, I remember uh, that first meeting that we had when we were just kind of talking about what you guys wanted from Cool Room, how what you guys envisioned. And then we went through obviously all the pretty things of like the logo and the colors and that awesome wall that you guys have there. Um, yeah. Like everything just made such a big impact and a difference. So I'm, I'm so happy for, for you guys um, and how like everything kind of came together at, mm-hmm. at that stage. Um, so, I mean, you opened in 2019. It was spring 2019, right? And now three years later, you have this great success. And I wanted to bring up some numbers just so like people knew like where you guys are at. Is that okay with you guys? Hell Yeah. <laughs> It'll be, it'll probably be updates for me too then. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I'm just going to open uh, our patient gem here. I know um, this is not as updated, right? Oh <laughs> yeah. That that's a work in progress. <laughs> we actually, <laughs> we have Lindsay started um, with us and she's been currently working on getting that up to date. So it should be soon, but um, those may not be the most accurate numbers. We do keep track. It's just not always on the patient gym uh, opportunities. Yeah, for sure. No, I get it. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep up with everything. <laughs> I know, I'm excited for when we do get it updated because I told them, I'm like, all right, Lindsay, once this gets updated, it's going to be, you are going to be the master of, of updating yeah. <laughs> as they come in. And I believe in you because I just can never, for some reason, do it. <laughs> so well, you can't do it all. That's for sure. <laughs> Well, so we, I, I know too that like when you guys started, we weren't using patient gym just yet. So this might not be mm-hmm. like the most updated from that like first year. And we started using patient gym to now we mm-hmm. have um, won $411,929, like over $400,000. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's How does that feel? <laughs> I like, mean, what? yeah. Yeah, it's a six-figure <laughs> business, and it's um, it's in less than three years. Mm-hmm. I know. I always have. Uh, I have to keep my reality check, you know, balance as well. Um, <laughs> just because I have such high standards for myself that I'm in my head, I'm like, well, we're not there yet as far as all these tickers and marks that people ask about for successes. But you know, really, when you compare it to just overall business metrics and numbers, you know, and they'll say most businesses will not even clear the red in the first five years or at all even past that. And that's not, that's just a typical thing. Um, so that's, you know, stuff that people say, even though it's just, you got to be patient. It's very long-term, but even still considering all that, it is like what you say, it's kind of amazing when you think of um, in a short time, even though it seems like it could be looked at as a long time too, but in three years, what we've been able to do and excited to see, um, you know, that progress as well. 
in the future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and you have to take into consideration all the different like factors that you guys had to go through. So like not only mm -hmm. starting in like late, like, well, not late, but like it was still 2019, but like late in the spring. Right. We went through a pandemic. So last year, yep. like, mm -hmm. I think like, what, like two years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we hadn't even been. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and you just recently added MSculpt to and MSculpt and MSella to what you guys are offering. So honestly, like this is, and this is just form our campaign for cool sculpting. Right. Like, I know that like, and this is just what you have here on Patient Gem, which I know that there's still probably more on that MSculpt and MSella side and mm -hmm. you know, like your recurrent clients that come and end up like buying more. So I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, like this is not bad for. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's what I hear. That's what I hear. <laughs> that oh, is, it is motivating. Like, honestly, yes. that is amazing. It's definitely something it's exciting. It is. Yeah. Very exciting. I mean, they say like celebrate the little moments, but this one's a huge one, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, we'll, we'll have it. We'll take any reason to celebrate, really. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. So, um, I mean, this is one of my questions. Like, I'm kind of glad that you kind of touched on it. But so, do you feel like marketing from the very start, like, really helped jumpstart that success? One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Again, like in that time, it's very hard to discern like where you want to put that those funds that you have because you're you know you're starting out like I said in the red and you haven't had a chance to do that and that's all you know part of the that's par for the game but um you really don't want to like go above that or you want to so it's just this this um considering okay that's an extra cost for me I wasn't thinking in terms of that before we actually opened and kind of was like oh we'll figure that out or also thinking another thing for me was a lot of things are done on social media now. So why would, you know, why would we necessarily need a, uh, a marketing company or something like that if we have somebody that just does that, but it really isn't. I mean, it is and it isn't. Um, but the amount of work that has been done um, outsourced to you guys is just there. We wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Like it, it definitely set us up for um, success. I would say just even timing wise, like not even though like investing a little more upfront to be able to do that was worth it all the way. Like I would have traded another cost for that. Um, and mm -hmm. like being able to say, okay, yes, it's worth it. And I do think a lot of medical practices, um, that's one thing, uh, at the time that I don't think a lot of like ones that are run by doctors or the traditional, um, medical office don't spend money on marketing. It's something that they just you know, they have their current, you know, database and clients and patients and marketing. That's not something they like to spend money on, but that was the game changer um, for us. Like we're starting from nothing. We don't have a database. We don't have current patients. We don't have um, anything existing to go on. So we had to create that, um, you know, in a sense and start somewhere and that takes time. So it was actually just, I think it is, it was completely necessary. And I'm so glad that we reconsidered doing it before we opened even. Um, we got we got that back very yeah. quickly. Yeah, because even from, um, again, like start from where we started, where you guys said like mm -hmm. no database to now, like at least on Patient Gem, we have almost like 3,500 people in your database. Right. Mm -hmm. and, then, and, that, and that is huge to to that success, right? Like just making sure that you guys keep that um, flow of leads coming in and then being mm -hmm. able to reach out, especially knowing that like with cool sculpting, it takes time, right? Like it's not like somebody just comes in and not knowing anything about it and just wants to buy right away. Right. Like they take their time researching and knowing like where to go. Like it is an investment and it is on your body. <laughs> Right, so right. People want to do that research. So knowing that you have people there that you can educate and let them know like what mm -hmm. you guys are about and why you are the way, the place to go, then I think I think it's just such a game changer as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I mean, honestly, like the like today's topic is bringing in that like personal touch that I think like you guys are so great at into sales. 
And I know like sales can be a touchy subject, especially mm-hmm. in this like medical aesthetics field, because people feel like they have to be that like car salesman, like they have to be yeah. like, buy now. And like, this is the offer and an offer of an offer, you know, and like, mm-hmm. it's, like, it just puts a lot of pressure, I feel on you guys <laughs> on this yeah. app that is trying to sell. And balancing that like business with medical aesthetics and like that experience that you went to like add onto it, but you guys have been doing such an amazing job at this. Um, So I just wanted to know, like, how does like sales look like for you? Um, I had to adjust my perspective and thinking on sales, just like the example you gave, because I'm a nurse, so I wasn't trained in business marketing or sales. I am trained to take care of people and you do that, you treat everybody the same, you take, you know, you take care of them, um, regardless of, you know, any other factors. And so for me, um, shifting that thinking to kind of like analyzing people in terms of how you approach them. And, you know, I don't know, just the whole sales thing at first, I had a bad taste in my mouth about it. Um, but it really, for me, it's become that it's, it's not sales. If you just, I think for us, we had to take that word out, even though it is sales, because everything you do is sales. You're either selling yourself, you're selling something. But for us, we were providing a service that we were the experts at, that we do every day, all day. Um, and we love taking care of patients. And we're there to provide that for them if and when they're ready. Um, so for us, it wasn't like, oh, we're going to pressure people to do that. That would be like, for me, like saying, oh, someone, you know, it's like suggesting someone needs an abdominoplasty or something like I would never do something like that. Whereas the companies that we've worked with, um, with the technology, they're the opposite. They're like, you don't let someone walk out, walk out of that room until you close a sale. And I'm like, well, I'm just not going to do that. That's not my style. That's I'm here to like, take care of them if they want that and provide the procedure and the education and all of that, but, um, not force someone to get something they don't want. So I, but I think if we take that on in our, in our minds as our role is to educate, um, provide any and all information they need, make sure that they're comfortable and they trust us that we're the experts at it. Um, and kind of seeing that we're fulfilling that role and we're, that we make the, that known to them that that's, that's what we're there to offer. And then it kind of takes care of itself. Like, I think that if someone's at that point, like you said, they're, whether they're at a readiness point to move forward with something like that or not, once they get there, they automatically are drawn to to coming to us for those reasons. So it kind of just, it sells itself. I, you know, just because it's, even though I know it's not sales, but um, so we kind of just focus on connecting with the people. Like we do more of like the uh, approach on, you know, psychology stuff and enjoying conversation with our patients, um, finding little things about them to, you know, like you would anybody, like a conversation, not just like robotically going through your motions and, you know, trying to just say, let me get through all these points. And then, okay, do you want to, do you want to do it? You know, but making them feel like they're being heard and their goals are being understood. Um, and that we're here to help them with those, not tell them what their goals are, but that we're here to understand what they want. And then how can we help you do that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would definitely say we have like, like Miranda was saying, it's not, I mean, obviously at the bot at the end of the day, it is sales, but more so for us, the emphasis is on like providing care and being the experts. So there are things built in to like our procedures and how we do things that would allow for like, you know, we are really good about follow-up. We make sure that like, if mm-hmm. somebody has come and they aren't really sure yet, um, that we follow up with them. And it's not just to be like, are right, you going to book yet? It's really genuinely being like, I know as a person, when I'm looking into something and it's a big, you know, a big investment or, you know, I, I might think of questions later, like I might mm-hmm. not be ready that day to commit, but I want the information. Um, and so we always make sure to follow up with them and they're, you know, there are like procedures in place to like automatically do that, but in a way that's like, Hey, is there any questions you have that I could help you, you know, understand? Or, you know, I always say like a lot of times people um, will say like, Oh, I need to talk to my husband about it or whatever. And I'm like, you know what, if he has any questions that you don't know how to answer, you text or call us and we're happy to mm-hmm. like answer those for you. Um, and like Miranda said, connecting with them on a level that like something you guys taught us from the very beginning about sales, but also just about psychology and people is like 
people want to go and buy from who they like, they know, and they trust. So we just Mm -hmm. want to be trustworthy. Right. And like, we want to be experts. And I think a lot of times in making sure that we're really knowledgeable about the topic, it does give people the opportunity to trust us. And just knowing that like, we don't treat them as just a number. Um, obviously we have to do business to to succeed and have a profitable business, Mm -hmm. but we're not just going to, Miranda has said this many times. We're not just going to push it on anybody that it may not be right for just to make a sale. Cause at the end of the day, if they're not going to get what they need out of it and you pressure them into doing it and then they do it and they're unhappy, that's a bad review. Like that's just not good mm-hmm. business practice and it's not going to make them feel good as a person. So not putting the pressure on, but making sure that there are things we do. It's not like we just totally abandon ship and we're like, we don't care if you buy or not, you know, obviously mm-hmm. we do. But we're not so, and I think she's done a great job of creating this environment and on her employees creating that. Because, you know, if you feel pressure from your employee to sell it, that's one, or your employer yeah. sell it, that you're going to feel like, well, like desperate almost for that person to book. Um, if you're like just working off of commission and you need to, you know, they're going to get mad at you if you don't make this sale kind of a thing, I think also plays a big part in like how mm-hmm. you feel you can treat that client. Um, so I think Rand has done a great job of like creating the environment of, of us feeling comfortable, just giving care to people, um, and being there f- their support and being honest about, you know, if you have a goal and you have a problem, we have a solution. Let's see if we can get you there like together mm-hmm. instead of just like buy this and give us your money. <laughs> but I think taking that pressure off allows you to focus on the patient instead of numbers or cycles or, you know, any of that stuff that gets, once that gets um, kind of into your brain and you're distracted by that, it's almost like, Yep. You just forget that there's a human sitting in front of you that you are supposed to be putting as the priority. And how can you do that when you have all these other things on your mind? So if you just sit there and you're like, I have information that they probably need. I have, I have something that they need. So let me find out what it is and how I can do that. Yeah. That your primary focus is that person. That's it's not anything else. It's not our success as a business and all of that other stuff comes from doing that. So um, kind of keeping that in the forefront is really important. Um, to just, and I, I also kind of let those meetings with patients be a little bit patient led a little, you know, obviously we have to kind of guide, um, and talk about things and they're here just to, to do that with us, but each person's different. I have people that come in that want to hyper-focus on the very specific details of the science and how it works, um, questions that you may not get up very often. And that's great. And I want to tend to that. And then I have people that are like, whoa, 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 that's too much. You've lost me. And now you're, you're, you know, you're not, they're just kind of trying to get through something and you can tell. So you got to gauge kind of what that person needs. What, what do they need from you? And then how can we tailor that to them? You know, each person. Definitely. I think, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, like sales is a conversation. And if you are doing it, like I have a solution for a problem, Mm -hmm. you just want to make sure that like what the problem is, so you can find that solution for them, especially if it is yours, right? Right, right. That is awesome. And so, you know, having that conversation makes makes it like sure that you start having that personal connection with them, like you said, mm-hmm. um, and just kind of be authentic and being yourselves, right? Right. So, um, I mean, I know that as you guys are, are, are talking like there are a few things and like key elements that you do go through like some like you said like some psychology behind it and mm-hmm. how you present certain ideas and whatnot and I know we can go very like deep into that but like what would be like an easy trick or tip that like somebody that's listening can like apply to their business right now as they're going into a consultation Um, I would say that what something we do here, um, is when you're going in and you are talking to a patient, like a trick of how, I know we're talking a lot about like, you want to make sure you treat them as a human being and not just a number, but like a trick of how to actually practically do that is like Miranda was saying, like, ask them questions. Um, don't just kind of go in and, and do like a very, you know, step-by-step, like, okay, you're done. Do you want to buy this? But when you go in asking them questions, um, you know, how they heard about it and then naturally organically, if they mention something in conversation, like, oh yeah, I have five daughters, you know, or something, 
don't just breeze over it and then go on to the next. Well, the, your side effect for cool sculpting will be this, that, and that. Like, address it and maybe kind of connect with them. You know, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you have five daughters. Like, I just had my first daughter. I can't imagine having five. You know, like, <laughs> and now it's not fake. It's legitimate. And like, yeah. I as a person want connection as well. So it helps. You know, I get fulfillment out of my job by being able to connect with patients. And then I think. Um, they in turn feel more, there's more rapport. So they're going to trust you more because you're not just like you care about them as a person or like you find whatever interesting that they said, not only getting that out of them and, and, you know, connecting with it, but writing it down on their consult form. So that if you do later, like if you go into a room, if they do treat, or, you know, if you are catching up, following up with them, you have something to talk about and they feel remembered and valued. Um, and like, you actually paid attention and you weren't just like trying to get through the consult so that they could book a treatment, you know? Definitely. And I know we talked about this earlier um, in another meeting where we were saying like how, you know, that's, I think the difference between a medical practice and a medical aesthetics, like the aesthetics part of it kind of, people want that spa experience. They want to feel like a VIP almost and like Mm -hmm. going into a place where they remember your name, remember um, little details of your life, like Kate had five, have five daughters. Um, it's such a huge difference and definitely making you feel comfortable with like, mm-hmm. hey, I trust, I like, and I feel like I almost know these people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, keeping track of everybody is probably really hard. Do you guys have any secrets though? <laughs> I, I mean, just kind of like Emily said, I, well, her memory is very good with little details, like um, about people. She's like, that's the person that blah, blah, or that's, and I'm like, how do you remember all that? I have, I have to definitely rely on, um, jotting things down. And I know people have asked me before, well, that's impersonal. If you're sitting in a consult and you're just like writing things down and you're not looking at the patient, but you can do it afterwards. And it can be just one word, whatever it is to trigger your memory. I use, I just put it on that consult form and I might think of it after they leave or I'll just take a second and do it while they're talking and still make eye contact. But um, yeah, definitely everybody's, I think that depends on the person too. Um, But for me, I like to, to jot a little something down so that, and even like we can put tags on things so that we know, um, you know, that if a reminder, like somebody said, I can't, you know, I can't make the appointment. I need to reschedule because of um, my mom's having a back surgery. And knowing that they're obviously preoccupied and they're going to forget to follow up and we don't want to like give them other things to have to follow up about, but waiting a certain amount of time, maybe putting a reminder that we just touch base later and say, how's everything doing? How's your mom recovering? Let us know if you need anything, but being available for them so that when they were present and we're on their mind, when they do decide, because sometimes even with me and my busy schedule, I, it might be something I want to do and had intended to do, but I just will go through days or weeks of time without stopping and doing it. And if someone happens to call me or text me and say, just making sure you didn't need anything, I'm actually like, oh, I'm glad you called. Can you actually schedule me for this day? You know, it, it's just being, uh, being present on their mind, relevant um, without, without it being an agenda, you know, just making yourself available, but without being like, I have an agenda to get somebody on the books kind of thing. Um, so we've done reminders, Emily, what else, uh, reminders on there for things just, yeah, I mean, I would definitely, the reminders is a good thing and this can look different for any, like just depending on your business, but on, we just, a lot of times on the calendar, we have a way we can write reminders. Um, and so, I mean, cause even if you're thinking about somebody, you, even in your personal life, you forget to follow up, right? Yeah. Like forget you, you can think about it all day long, but like, it always seems to be the times I can't text when I'm like driving or something, but right. so we write reminders on the calendar and also taking notes like in their chart to remember that specific thing about that person. But like, I can remember a specific situation where, um, we had somebody that had a virtual consult, I think, and she ended up texting us saying like, um, oh, I'm so sorry. I need to cancel. I've been up all night crying. My cat passed away last night. And I mean, as a human being that has a cat, I was very, I felt really bad for her. And I wasn't, of course, I'm not going to be like, darn, like I couldn't sell her cool sculpting today. Like she has other things on her mind and her priorities right now, but I didn't want to just forget about, you know, her to, to forget about her or to just like, you know, have her, she doesn't she, become very unimportant. Right. And so I wrote a reminder, like for myself, I said, you know, I'm so sorry to hear that. Like genuinely that's terrible. I'm th- where you're in our thoughts. And then I put a reminder for like 
two days or maybe a few days later just to check on her and just see how she was doing. And I did think about her over those days, you know, like just, Mm -hmm. gosh, I feel bad. Like I hope she's doing okay. And so I texted her and I didn't even, I don't think I even said anything about cool sculpting. Honestly, I was just like, you know, this is Emily from cool room. I know that you had to cancel your appointment the other day, but I just was wanted to let, you know, I was thinking about you and I know it's so hard to like lose a pet. And then she ended up, you know, reaching back out and was like, oh my gosh, that means so much to me. And she's like, can I actually come in for a console? So she initiated the rescheduling part. Um, and she came in and then she ended up that day. I think I even mentioned I had written on her chart. I, I remembered it, but like, you can't always rely on memory. <laughs> especially if you're, if you're a bigger practice and that, you know, the same person's not maybe seeing them, but I remembered and also had written down. And so when I went in, you know, I had mentioned something else about it. Like, again, how are you doing? I'm really sorry that happened. You know, it's so hard. And we connected over our pets and she ended up booking that day, like a lot of cool sculpting. Um, so it wasn't like, it was just by being a human being and following up. It's like the combination, right. Of like, you have to connect with them on a personal level, but you also have to have those follow-up procedures in place, or like Miranda said, they're going to forget and it's going to fall off the radar and they may have intended to do it, but they didn't because you mm-hmm. never called up and they mm-hmm. were in the spot to like initiate it on their own. Yeah. Right. Right. And go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say that depending on practice size, that can look differently. Like she said, where it's ideal, it doesn't mean this is always going to play out that way, but it is ideal, I think, to have a continuity of care for a person. So in other words, when they come in for a consult, whoever that they see for that consult, in theory, it would be ideal for them to have the interaction with that person throughout. Now, obviously in like bigger settings, you have multiple providers and different care and things like that, whether it be text and, you know, they're coming in and there's different things, but with us, it's easy for us to have that one specialist that can carry it from the beginning through and then um, kind of create that connection with them and maintain it. Cause it's something familiar to them and it's something that they like, they like to come back and feel like they, people remember them and you know, those kind of things. Now, if that can't be the case all the time, because you have so many employees or, you know, high volume um, I always stress with um, the staff, how important it is to, um, make sure that everything that you're doing as far as your process um, at the office for charting um, calls, every system that you have needs to be consistent enough. Not that we don't have room to be our own personalities and touch to it, but to where if one person leaves one day, but can't come the next day because their kid is sick or something, somebody else can come in and they can get everything that they can find and get the answers to everything that they need through those systems without having to call or guess or whatever. So we can smoothly pick up and carry that through. Or if someone does the consult, but they're doing someone else is there to do the treatment. It's nice to just have, you know, some, maybe the consult person introduce them and say, Hey, I remember me or come in and say, hi, I, you know, I wanted to pop in and say, hi, I know I'm not doing your treatment, but something to kind of bridge that gap. Um, yeah, as well. that is huge. And I mean, I can do a whole other episode with you guys about like customer mm-hmm. journey and processes and making sure that you have that continuity of care and making sure that like you kind of keep, like we said earlier, like your brand in every single step, mm-hmm. or, like that every single touch point that you have with your customer. Um, so was there ever a point where you were like, okay, personal touch is part of like, it's a key to our success or was it just kind of an organic thing that came about with you guys? I mean, I think as people, that's how we, not that you, you like, it's good. Again, it's good to have variety in personalities and things like that, but like going back to thinking who would I want to be doing this journey with me or to who would fit it's being able to like, you can, you can train skills all day long. You can, you can get people up to speed on, on those kind of things, but you can't really do that with personality. Um, So that's not something to say that picking only certain personalities, but just picking people that I think already just naturally have that kind of outlook in life and they, it applies to everything. So it's not something that you're having to like, try to re um, configure in them, which is impossible because it's not their nature. Um, But, you know, someone that has those similar um, goals and, um, Value. you know, approaches to, to people in general. Um, that way it's kind of natural. And it just, like you said, it's more organic that way because that's how we interact with people, whether it's at work or at another setting. 
any setting in, in your life. Yeah, I definitely like like Peely said, val- like values is a big thing. We all want to have similar like values and you can't really teach those. Um, so our core values, we want to make sure like every new staff member shares those. Um, and also I think just training is a very important thing in this too. I, I was, we actually have um, a newer staff member that's going through training right now. And, you know, she's kind of expressed that like at previous jobs, maybe she didn't have a lot of training and it made her really not confident and not able to like do her job very well. Um, and also like making sure they're trained really well. And also that they feel comfortable asking, like, you know, mm-hmm. clarifying to like, you know, whoever right. they're here maybe and Miranda has always been really good at like making sure no question is like you're not going to be judged or she's not going to think down on you because you have a question about something she'd rather you find out the answer um and you know use your resources but um I also had another point and I totally forgot it as I was talking so well I think some people might think like if you have to ask a question or you don't understand something that it's a reflection on their capabilities to perform the job, but it's not to me, that's just your, that's showing that you're taking initiative to better yourself, that you're wanting to understand in all capacities and, um, you know, just take it on in a different level instead of just regurgitating things like a robot kind of stuff. So I like that. I like when people ask questions or suggest different ideas. And like, I'll say with you, I have questions still. Like I'm always, it doesn't, there's nobody that's just going to always know everything. Like you are a team that's going to all have a different, um, you know, asset to bring to the table. Um, and Emily's strengths balance out a lot of things that I don't have. And that's something that's important. So we, we do have differences and I think that's important too, but I think just kind of it's, it's really, when you go look at hiring and building a team, it's, it's hard. I, I would say someone did say, one of the biggest challenges of running a business is go- or starting a business is going to be staff and people because of the, tr- whether it be turnover, finding the right people. And it is, I would say that's definitely the biggest challenge. Um, but it's, it's important. It's huge. And I think it's vital to making um, your brand uh, consistency stay in the forefront as well too. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, that's something that um, I mean, I think, it was something that Luis and I learned from the very beginning when we were kind of like starting this up for us like five years ago. But um, especially now, like when I got pregnant and like I was not expecting my first trimester to be like what it was like for me to be like mm-hmm. in bed all day without like doing anything. Um, so like having that team and being able to to know that my clients were taken care of the business was being taken care of and there was not going to be like something crazy when I came back was huge, but it definitely takes a lot of work, a lot of time, like training people. Um, I think for me, that's kind of like, I, I enjoy training, um, but it is one of the most like time consuming mm-hmm. aspects. Of it, it is, it is. And you do have that temporary feeling of a setback. It's not necessarily evident in the numbers, but um when you're looking at things overall time-wise and all that, it does feel like, okay, well, temporarily I do have to take some steps back, but in in the long run, it's worth it. If you can put as much time as needed um, up front for training, it is really going to save you a lot of just things that you would have to tend to later in correcting or changing or reevaluating and all that. If you can just start that from the beginning and and it's important. So it's something that you, you know, it's okay to put time into and making sure, you know, that people, like she said, Lindsay feeling, um, or Claudia, whoever it is at the time, feeling like they are, they're secure with their support system so that they're confident in going in, but that they have these resources that they're, they can rely on us. They can come to us. They can learn, learn from us, whatever it is to get them to a point where they feel, um, good on their own kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, definitely, like, I feel like your success has been, there's so many factors to it. You guys have been so good at what you do, like experts at cool sculpting, of course, but um, creating those authentic connections have been really key into bringing in and not only new sales, but recurring ones as well, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's been huge. 
How, how often do you feel like you get somebody else come back for more? I mean, way more than I thought we would when we started this, this um, business, because, you know, when you think about, uh, you know, the nature of cool sculpting is permanent, you would think that you would have a lot of one-time patients and customers. Um, so with that being said, it being something that you would have to constantly be generating lots more of new traffic because, not, you know, you don't have that other to sustain. Whereas people that have a lot of other services, they can maintain their their clientele and patients with that. Yeah. Um, but for us, I was kind of thinking, okay, what what can we do that can retain or if at all, because, you know, it's, it's supposed to be permanent. So why would someone come back a bunch of them? But I've been so surprised, pleasantly surprised. We, I think most of our um, clientele are repeat repeat customers and or patients uh, once they, it only takes one time once they, you know, have the experience and come in and are um, have the procedure go through that process of, you know, follow up where we kind of reevaluate their, um, you know, results and happiness after that step step. It's pretty, I would say, I, I, Emily, you might be able to comment on the numbers a little more, but pretty common that they come back for their follow-up and add something else on, but it's just a different area or, you know, so people are coming, they're coming up. And now we've got the M sculpt and um, that's a big thing too, that draws back. But I think just coming in and are a good follow-up without stalking and pressuring people, like not forgetting about them, like, oh, hey, you're one and done. You've got your procedure. We don't care about you anymore. We have nothing to, we're not going to put our attention into you because of that. No, we still, we do. We would follow up. We'd say, Hey, you know, we're doing a, a Pilates class for, you know, our patients this month. If you want to come, it's complimentary. And we go with them and we, you know, yeah. did the class with them and it was kind of fun or, you know, Hey, here's a gift card for Starbucks. If you want to, you know, come in for your follow-up pictures or, but getting them, getting them back in and having that um, interaction with them afterwards and not just forgetting about them. I think um, has been, Emily's probably better at commenting on the the numbers and stuff. No, with- I think, I mean, I think that's about right. Uh, um, obviously we have new clients all the time too, but like, it's like you were saying, I don't think we expected to have so many regulars Yeah, and I love our regulars and we take really good care of them too. Like we're always like, brand is very good about like being generous. Like, yeah, we want to take care of the people that are coming back again and again. So like if they, they want to free M sculpt, they can do it. Or, you know, like they, we definitely try to take care of them. And then we also, I think you know, obviously all the things she said, but the client experience, we really try to like elevate while they're here too, so that it feels more like a spa day. And so they want to keep coming back. Like nobody would want to come back. It's not, you know, sculpting. Yeah. they come back for the cool sculpting and for the results, but I think also they come back to us because it's mm-hmm. like just such a positive experience. We have like our treatment room we recently redid. So it's nice and like, you know, calming in there. Um, and we, we always have like snacks and drinks for them and we've got Netflix and, you know, just it's little things, um, or like offering them coffee. Um, but it, it really makes them, we have so many people, I can't tell you how many people are like, this feels a lot more like a spa day than I thought it was going to. Mm-hmm. And we're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's our goal. So, um, I think they want to come back for the relationship that we maintain as well. Like adding those personal details and like sharing things, you don't have to get too personal, but just sharing little things. Yeah. Like, casual things, even about yourself. Like, we, you know, we were just, uh, there was a patient this morning, I was chatting about reality TV that we watch, you know, like we were just talking about the shows that we enjoy watching, yeah. but just making it more of a connection and more of a positive experience. So they do want to come back. Um, and then on the sales aspect of it, we do implement things, um, like doing a free sculpt session with a cool sculpting package at their follow-up so that they actually do come back to the follow-up because that's something that's challenging sometimes in cool sculpting or anywhere, probably any procedure that you have to wait for results. Um, people, by the time they have their results are like, I either see the result and I like it and I don't see a point in coming back or, or they think it was such a gradual change that they're like, I'm not really sure if it did anything. So I don't want to go back. Um, I actually had somebody, uh, text us and we had had her on the books. It's important too to just schedule their follow-up the day they leave for treatment. Even if they're going to reschedule it, we always tell them like, it's, I know it's like three months away and like, you're probably not going to, probably not going to work for you, but it'll just be a reminder to both of us. You'll get the text the day before. If you need to change it, we'll change it. But somebody had, I think she had not come to her 90 day follow-up and she never ended up rescheduling, but then she texted us out of the blue and was like, Hey, I don't think I'm seeing much change from my cool sculpting, but I want to come in 
for a follow-up and I'm like, absolutely, let's get you in. And so we got her in really soon, took pictures. She had great results. Um, and she was like, wow, I, these results are amazing. And, um, can I actually add on another one? <laughs> so like, I mean, it's just, it's important. There's so many factors like you're saying yeah. that go into it, but I think patient experience, making it very enjoyable for them, connecting with them on a personal level and just like not being a robot, you know, um, and then follow up is really important, um, in all, in all of that and keeping regulars. So yeah, we love definitely. It. it's easy for people to be like, I have other things to worry about. We already treated them. There's no reason to waste time on it. If they're not coming, they don't want to come kind of thing. And I get to an extent, like you don't want to overdo stuff if you try a few times, but that's one thing that I was saying, I think is critical to, um, making sure that people are happy in, in the end is connecting with them at a follow-up because life gets busy or they're uncertain. They don't really think about it. It goes on. And then they're just kind of, their impression they're left with is, uh, it was, it did or it didn't, but it's just eh, kind of blase, whatever. But when they come back and are actually able to see the measurable results, you know, because we as humans need something like that, as opposed to just kind of gauging, like to be able to see something or have a measurable result that we can look at that you can't deny um, that leaves them feeling, you know, they don't have that doubt anymore. They're they're They can see that it's, and they're happy with it. So you want to leave on a note where they're satisfied. And if we just forget about them, even though, you know, they don't, might not show up or this and that, which you're going to have those too sometimes, but, um, then really we're, we're taking a risk on someone just having a bad impression of, of us too, because we didn't close out to make sure, okay, if, if it didn't go well, or you're not happy with them, how can we fix that? Because that's another thing too. We don't want, we want to just not forget about them because even though most every time they come in, it's not, never been an issue, but if there is something that we could make better, why not? Like, but we need to see you to be able to do that. And we've got a results guarantee. So why would you not want to come to your follow-up mm-hmm. if you didn't think anything yeah. happened? Because if it didn't, we'll treat you again for free. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. so. yeah, that's huge. I mean, it definitely takes more money to bring in a new lead than mm-hmm. to bring somebody that you already treated, to bring somebody back. So that's huge. Oh my gosh, this was such a good conversation. And I'm pretty sure we can keep mm-hmm. talking about it. But um, to all of our listeners out there, like if you want to learn more about Emily and Miranda and Cool Room and how they've created this amazing business in three years uh, or mm-hmm. less, if you discount the pandemic, um, I am so excited that you guys are partnering with Everable so that we can bring in more value to our clients. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited that you guys are uh, able to coach our current and hopefully uh, new clients, future clients. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So if you guys want to learn more about what we do, how we can help you, make sure to reach back out to us. We are so happy to look, honestly, I am genuinely happy. Like just as we were talking about like creating connections, I feel like with you guys, we created a really good relationship. We follow each other on Instagram. We see like each other's kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, I'm genuinely really excited and happy to have you guys um, bring all of everything that you've learned. And I'm excited to get onto this journey. <laughs> We're, the feeling's mutual. We're, we've been, you know, thrilled the whole way. That's been a fun process and excited for more. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, Emily, for coming into the podcast. It was such a great conversation. Hopefully we can see you guys again. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you.